Hello gardeners, thank you for joining us on Mid-American Gardener. I'm Diane Nolan, your host, and we're going to talk about plants and see what kind of questions the viewers have for us today. But before we do that, I wanna find out, well, let you find out who's on the show with me. And we've got three really talented folks and direct your questions towards their expertise. All right, let's start first with Karen Ruckel. Hi there, Karen. Hi. <laughs> I uh, work at Hare Nursery and I uh, specialize kind of in shrubs and trees and some perennials. And I have a question from uh, Kathy in Champaign about fertilizing peonies. And she wants to know when's the best time to fertilize peony bushes, how often, and the best type of fertilizer. Now really, we've, we've missed probably one of the better times and that would be in spring when the foliage is just coming up uh, maybe about a foot tall and you can fertilize again after flowering, which we've passed once again on that. But, uh, and then avoid getting any of the fertilizer on the crown. So this year I'd say we we kind of missed, missed the time period. I've seen some references for fall fertilizing and most of the peony bushes, not anything really strong. Um, I saw like a 5-10-5, so maybe like a 10-10-10, if you can find that more easily um, would be fine. But I think a lot of people don't really even worry about fertilizing and they tend to mm -hmm. do well, but if you like to fertilize, it it's not gonna hurt. So if you don't do a high fertilizer. So low fertilizer amounts and maybe compost too if they have yeah, it. Yeah, and, and typically dress. top dressing, you can do that anytime safely. That'd be good. Well, very good. And the peonies are so beautiful, so you want them to look nice. Yes. Thank you, Karen. And let's go to the guy in the middle, Dave Plussard. Good to be here. I'm the garden center manager at Hare Nursery in Peoria, specializing in trees, shrubs, and any other plant that lives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do have a question here from a viewer. How can I effectively manage wild violets in a space I am using and will continue to use for a small food garden? Well, violets, which are state flower, happen to be very difficult to control. They have a little stem that uh, is called a rhizome that makes it difficult to really control them by spraying. And I think especially in a food garden, you would not want to spray it. So I would just recommend that you dig them out. And it might seem a little bit slow and you won't get everything out initially and they'll keep popping up for a little while. But I think ultimately that's your best bet for trying to control them in your food garden. And in wet weather? It's a little easier. Yes, weeds do pull easier when it's wet. In yeah, dry. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Dave. And let's go on to Ella Maxwell. Hi, Ella. Hi, I also work at Hare Nursery, and my specialty is um, the same as theirs. We're horticulturists <laughs> together, so trees, shrubs, perennials, uh, whichever. And I have a question today from a viewer about Virginia bluebells. And they want to know that when they're done, do they need to cut them back? And the answer would be um, the foliage does disappear. They're a spring ephemeral. They come up early in the spring and then the foliage will yellow and you can cut it back as well um, whenever it's necessary. Uh, even if you don't, they'll just kind of dry up and disappear. And it's pretty quick too, isn't it? I mean, they, they won't be around too long no, when it gets hot. No, uh, they're, they're already disappearing. In, okay. my, in my garden. Beautiful wildflower. Okay, let's go next to the Did You Know. Are you thinking about getting a rain barrel? Well, you should. Rainwater can actually help improve the health of your gardens, lawn, and trees. Rainwater is naturally soft and devoid of minerals, chlorine, and other chemicals found in city water. All right, and now it's time for the phone lines. Let's go to Joe's question on line six, something about an oak tree. Hi, Joe. Hello. I have uh, some old oak trees that the bark is popping off uh, in chunks, and it's going clear down. It looks like it's going through the cambium layer, but I'm not sure, and I'm wondering if it's a disease or it's just the age of the trees but I don't think it's the age of the trees so all of them aren't that old. It started out on a tree that's probably 100 years old and uh, the other trees are one tree is about 200 years old and one tree might 
might be 50 years old. Wow, that's, that's outstanding, Joe. Joe, is it in one certain area, or is it um, always at the same height off the ground? Does it go all the way around the trunk? How big of an area are you concerned about? Uh, one of the trees is probably about, uh, I guess, two square feet, and it's about shoulder height. Probably, oh, it's probably eight or ten inches wide and a uh, foot and a half or two feet tall. Uh, another tree, it looks to me like it's just kind of almost like lightning has struck the tree, except that when that bark comes off, it's dark underneath there. And the third tree uh, has a place on it that's probably, oh, 10 or 12 feet high. It's probably about two square feet. Well, what do oh, we the think? Rules out in deer. Yeah, mm -hmm. a little too high for that. Um, yeah. You do know that the, the bark will kind of peel off itself. It, it, as it makes new uh, bark, he mentioned the cambium. So some of the bark, it is typical for it to wear off. And there is a fungal disease that can make a smooth bark on an oak. And so the bark looks totally different. Usually it's more silverish, but I'd be a little concerned, Joe, about the darkness underneath could indicate maybe uh, some type of dieback canker. What do you think? Well, look under the bark that is, well, when it's popped off, look at the wood underneath. You mentioned the cambium tissue. And if you see little, um, Engravings? Engravings or galleries is what we call them are indicative of borer and it's not unusual for bark to come off if a borer insect, uh, that's the larval stage usually of a beetle or maybe a clear winged moth and that can cause it to, to pop off and that can be difficult to control for a tree particularly when they're that old. Should he maybe have an arborist <clears throat> come and check it out? particularly trees that are that old and, mm -hmm. and that valuable, especially if they're in good shape. Yes, I would have a local arborist in your area come and inspect the trees, determine what may be done to them, if there's anything you can do yourself or is it something that maybe they would have to take care of for you. That'd probably be the best thing to do. Okay, so thank you for your question. I hope that works out well. Oaks are so gorgeous. Let's go to mm -hmm. line uh, five next, and Della has a question about transplanting. Hi, Della. Hi. I'm wondering when I can transplant my strawberry plants and also Easter lilies. And they were regular Easter lily plants that were potted, and when they quit blooming, I put them in the garden. They've been in there a while, and I just want to know when I can transplant both of these things. Okay, let's go with strawberries first. Everyone jump in. I, I well, think you could do it. I was going to say, jump in and say now. Yeah, you can do <laughs> or, them now. You or can really any time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're easy to do. And it can be up in through to September as well. But. Mm -hmm. Well, most of the, the mother plant is making the little side runners mm -hmm. now, and those can easily root. And once they have some roots, then they could be transplanted. And um, I, I think you'd be set to go with the Easter lilies. Um, I, if they're in the garden and you want to move them, I think the, the I'm not sure when the best time. Fall well, I, or spring when they're dormant. Yeah, I'd say either when the, the foliage dies right. back mm -hmm. this summer or in early spring if you remember where the stalk is to, mm -hmm. to find so it. So as it dies back, maybe notice it then. That's probably the easiest time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. that won't be until fall, like you said. Okay, so some transplanting, and it would actually be cooler in the fall. Strawberries don't seem to mind it if you water them in well. All right, let's go to Barbara's question. She has a weeping mulberry question and she is on line two. Hi, Barbara. Hello. Uh, we have a mulberry tree, a weeping mulberry tree that has lots of brown spots on the underside of the leaves. This year, it's probably 15 to 20 years old and this is the first time. Okay, so brown spots. Do the, do the uh, upper side of the leaves seem to be affected? Well, it eventually it goes through, but it looks like it started on the underneath side. Okay. 
what kind of a? I, I would think it was a leaf spot, and mm -hmm. uh, it's probably because of all the humidity and the moisture. And to be quite honest, I think it would be just mostly cosmetic. Have Sometimes. the leaves yellowed or fallen off, Barbara? But they're covered with those brown spots. Yeah. We sprayed spectricide insect killer on it. Should we just not do anything to it? Well, well, it, well the, the, the problem you have is that it, it's not an insect that's caused by a, a disease typically. And unfortunately, a leaf, once it's infected, you can't reverse those spots. So any new growth you could protect with a fungicide from it maybe spreading, but those old leaves, unfortunately this year, it's not gonna look pretty. And, and I've noticed that with some of the plants in my garden, that some plants just, mm -hmm. uh, the spots, the leaf spots, because of the high humidity mm -hmm. and the high moisture just look lousy. Yeah. But, but as long as, as the plant is still alive, you're, you're fine. Yeah. Okay, so there you have it. And that question from Barbara, is reminding me of a question that we got from a viewer on Facebook that I want to have our panelists um, talk about. It's This one is about tomatoes with leaf spots. So if we can get those pictures up, there they are. And can I take it, send it to you, Karen? Yeah, it, it, um, these are great pictures that they, they posted on Facebook and then there was a conversation. Um, we felt it was probably trying to diagnose by a, a picture and not getting all the information, it's a little tough, but we saw, thought it was probably septoria leaf spot the thing I would say going forward, and, and somebody had actually mentioned try to take all the affected leaves off, and, and you had said that, well, it was probably the whole plant, that a wet year like we have and not good sunny hot days for the tomato plants has been pretty bad. So looking forward, you can spray to protect new growth, potentially. That's very tough. I, I think I, I can't spray. I mean, it's every two days we've been having storms, it seems like. So the thing is to think about next year, um, clean up. Don't leave any of these leaves or plants laying in your, your garden for next year. Remove them from the yard, burn them, or put them if you have a lawn collection, get rid of it out of the yard. Then think about next spring, do not be hurried to get the tomato plants in. Um, you'll get tomatoes, just, just a little bit more patience. The first to the, to the block with tomatoes, you, you know, the plants will suffer, so wait till it's, a little warmer, a little drier in spring, and mulch can help. I typically do a pretty thick layer of newspapers and then I put straw on top of that to uh, keep the newspaper from blowing away. But I put that on immediately when I planted the tomato plants, even before I've watered them in, so I don't get splashing of any of the um, diseases that could be dormant in the soil that, that then if you have a susceptible plant and right conditions will overtake your poor tomato plant. And hopefully so. that will help because I think the mulching immediately, that's what I do. It's well, and, and looking at these pictures, you know, sh she might have to go to the farmer's market this year. I mean, that plant looks really, really bad. Wow. Okay. That you don't want. <laughs> uh, let's answer one more question from the phone lines and then go to some email questions. Uh, let's go to line four and it's talking about mulch, something for mulch. Hi, line four. Hi. I'm phoning because our 45-year-old white pine trees gave us thousands of pine cones this year. And I was wondering if we could chop those up and use it as mulch. Yes, well, it'd make great mulch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely would. I've even used them whole because I didn't want to chop them up, <laughs> <laughs> but along with other mulch that I had. But yeah. I've had more people offer me pine cones this year, and I just... I use some of them decoratively, but yes, you can use it for mulch. It, if and you get them chopped up enough, you can even incorporate them into the soil to uh, improve the soil for some of the acidic plants, like the hydrangeas that you want to turn blue, or uh, your rhododendrons, things like that. And with the pine needles in combination, yeah. that could oh, be yeah. a very pretty mulch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you get lots of organic matter like that, you use it. Thank you very much for that question. That was a good one. Let's go back to our panelists for some email questions. Karen, we'll start with you. I have Alice who um, had a question about amaryllis and she's had amaryllis for a number of years and she'd received one as a gift and she noticed the one that was in a gift in a kit had no roots. It was just a smooth bulb. So she wanted to know about hers that she overwinters and cares for through the years that she's always just replanted them um, 
with some roots on them, should she rub off those roots from the previous year? And I would say the amaryllis, some of the roots are thick enough that they will make it through a um, storage season and then will start to regrow and will be you know, viable roots. Other times they do shrink up and they, 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 they're just dead. So I would say you've been doing this 25 years and it's worked great. Continue with what you've been doing, not, not rubbing them off because I would say half the roots probably are still viable and will start to grow and get your, your amaryllis back in that uh, growing and blooming cycle for you. Okay, thank you. And Dave, you're next. Well, I have a question from Terrence. He has been given blackberry starts from a neighbor and wanting to know what direction uh, the house is facing, if that's the direction that they should plant them based on the sun. And bl blackberries really are a full sun plant, so I would put them where they can get the most sun. However, Brambles as a whole will tolerate a little bit of shade and if you have to put them in an area that is closer to the house for convenience and it still gets some shade, that would be fine, but my choice would be the one with the most spots, or spot with most sun. There we go. I knew yeah. what you meant. The sun yeah. spot and is They the knew best. what you meant too. Be good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Ella, you're next. Um, mine is uh, Peter and Betsy in Homer, Illinois had a question about their peach tree, um, six years old, and they've pruned it in winter, but there are just so many shoots and flowers and fruit, and they want to know, is it too late? Can they still do something? Uh, yes, it wouldn't be too late for the home gardener. It's quite labor intensive, but they could thin the fruit to improve the quality of uh, the the fruit that would be left, and certainly they could do some topping of shortening some side branches, and I, I think that would be fine. That's a great problem to have to thin some <laughs> yeah. fruit. Yeah. And if you don't, as she said, the quality of the fruit would be that it'd be predominantly the seed, and you would not have a lot of flesh there from the peach to eat. So while people are hesitant to do it, if you want the best peaches, you really need to thin them. And I've seen branches just literally break mm -hmm. off yeah. right. you if you don't to. do it. Yeah. support them. Okay, so get out there and do some thinning. Well, let's go back to the phone lines and we're going to see what Patty's question about a red bud is on line three. Hi, Patty. Hi, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Love your show. I have a red bud tree that's about 10 years old and this spring it started putting on its little pink buds, but it stopped. It didn't go to flower and I just kept watching it and I thought, hmm, so I gave it some uh, fertilizer spikes and uh, just kind of let it go for a while. And then it, uh, believe it or not, started getting flowers on it. And I really thought the, the tree was dying. But now it, it's uh, not flowers, I'm sorry. It never did flower. It put on some leeks. Okay. And now about a third to a half of the tree has leeks. What do you think? I think it was probably the cold. We had such uh, cold weather in the spring. It was a very nice long spring, but we had some really low temperatures when trees were being, beginning to flower and red buds are very early. So I, that's my suspicion is that they were damaged in one of the cold spells we had. Which is not fatal right. and will reverse itself probably. Well, I'm, in a, I'm nice a little spring. worried because she mentioned that part of the tree doesn't sound like it may be leafed out completely. So that's another issue. That could be another issue. And a wet year like this can bring up a lot of root rot and, and vascular diseases that the tree can be more stressed out from having too much moisture. So yeah, it's, it's always important with anything, trees or shrubs, if you don't have any leaves and you have bare branches, don't wait because they're not going to really come mm -hmm. by the time it's the end of June. So they could uh, prune out anything that is dead or damaged. Well, and I would say with that too, is that cleaning your pruning equipment because right. you know mm -hmm. we don't know what maybe is going on in that tree. Clean off your stuff before you go do something else in the yard. And, and that could be a 10% bleach solution. Mm -hmm. So that's a cup of bleach and a gallon of water. Rubbing alcohol also right. does a good job. Little Lysol wipes, that's what I <laughs> <Yeah>. like. <laughs> okay, you got lots of choices, but you don't want to spread it. 
Sure. So, all right, let's then go on to B's question on line six about a plum tree. Hi there, B. Uh, hi. Uh, it's an or ornamental plum. Um, my son got it a couple of years ago for my husband. It, it's a big tree, but and it's been doing fine. This spring we noticed a lot of the branches are just broken down. Leaves are dead. I know the branches are very delicate. They're, you know, they're small, but it, it's just all over the tree. There's no reason we haven't had that bad a windstorm or anything. I had no idea if, is it the delicacy of the tree itself or do you have any ideas? Hmm. Well, I do know they're short-lived. Right, and, and they're short-lived because they can yeah. get some insect problems, specifically little mm -hmm. shot hole borers. They just have very small little tiny exit holes, and, and usually it, it can die a branch at a time. Also, as Karen's talking about, some of these vascular diseases. So um, And the peach tree borers plums will get, so right. that's another problem with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Unfortunately, in our area, uh, plums, ornamental plums do not grow uh, real well and live a very long time, as Diane said. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there are numerous problems that they can have. So, unfortunately, other than cleaning it up, removing the dead, as we just talked about, um, keeping the tree uh, watered when there's drought, and which would not be right now, obviously, but those are some of the things you need to do to, to make sure the tree uh, does as well as it can. Well, I, I think I feel like we're all doomsday with some of these problems, but it, I think it's almost like I, Ella and I were talking about. I've got a magnolia that this year is putting out a fantastic, great growth this year, but then we've got other trees that, when you can have other stresses or other problems, the extra moisture just compounds their problem. Mm -hmm. When when we think, oh, you know, they should still be fine. So you may not want to replant a plum in the same spot, <laughs> I think is what we might be saying, because there's lots of other choices. So, But it may take a while for it to, to actually not make it. All right, let's go to Roger's question on line five about lilacs. Hi, Roger. Hi. I uh, was wondering, I have a lilac bush that my mother had left behind, and I was wondering, I have suckers coming up, and I'm wanting to carve them off the roots possibly uh, turning them into new trees, new, new bushes. Is there anything you can offer? Well, I've done it for my lilacs. That's not at all unusual for lilacs. I would wait till they go dormant and then I would just simply dig them up and replant them. Sometimes you don't get a whole lot of root system when you're taking a sucker off of a lilac, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to root in. I, they really are not very difficult to get started again. So I would say this fall, have at it. Good. I have several trees that are from family members, yes. so I do enjoy that as well. Thank you for your question. And we're going to go on to Ellie's question on line two about some insects on a shrub. Hi there, Ellie. Hi, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I have some shrubs in front of the house. I think they're euonymus. Oh, yes. And they're covered with little white bugs. Yes, and they I are. I wondered what oh. I could spray them with. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's a scale. It's a scale problem. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure that there are very many good sprays that will take care of that. Oh, yes, there are. Are there? Oh, yeah. Dormant oil would be very effective. Okay. And, of course, it's not, uh, it's completely safe to use. Uh, during the spring when the, um, Spy Brattlery spireas are in bloom and maybe near finishing, you can use some other insecticides as well. But right now your choice will be the dormant oil. And then another thing I have done is that you can simply take your finger and just rub them off the back of the leaves, rub them off the stems, and that will give you very good control as well. So, uh, and just wash your hands afterwards and you're done. I do like to trim Euonymus a little bit. I trim mm -hmm. out the worst ones. Yes, and you can do that. Get mm -hmm. them off site. But it will be a continual problem once you get them. They're very, very hard to completely eliminate. So you need okay. to be checking for them every year. And now I don't have them. The you don't? I selectively oh. chose other things. I mean, they didn't die. I just took them out. I, t I did the hard decision. So. That's not very, <laughs> but sometimes you have to decide, 
cause and effect, do I want to spend time? But yes, you will have to keep watching for mm -hmm. that. But that scale, that is pretty common. And also scale is on uh, dogwoods, red twig, yellow mm -hmm. twig. So uh, rejuvenating proving sometimes will help mm -hmm. to have Good. newer growth. Okay, well let's look at a little mag quiz next. What weather do pansies do the best in? A, hot weather, B, humid weather, C, cool weather, D, very cold weather. C, cool weather. These flowers tend to not do so well in the summer. They usually get smaller as the weather gets warmer. So try to grow your pansies when the weather is cooler. Okay, we wanna thank each of you for watching. Thank you for being here and we will see you next week. Have a great week gardening. Goodbye.